Hey, um, it's uh, just about nine o'clock, so uh, we'll get started. I, uh, I want to welcome all of you. Uh, it's so nice to see some new faces, and it's lovely as always to see um, our old friends here uh, as we go through our process of kicking off season 74. So uh, a few housekeeping things. One, um, we are, uh, full disclosure, we are recording this so that people who couldn't be here can hear the information and get it. So if you do not want to appear on camera, come on in. If you do not want to appear on camera, please uh, hang out towards the back rows. Um, we're all wearing masks, so nobody will know who we are anyway. <laughs> And uh, also be aware that um, the mics we are using can pick up uh, conversations from the audience. Uh, so uh, if you want to, you know, complain about my shirt or you know something uh, crazy I said, uh, you know, make sure that you're aware that the mics are live. Uh, so, uh, all right. Uh, Again, I'm thrilled to see so many people here. Um, my name is Steve Tobin. I'm the president of Colonial Players for My Sins. Um, and uh, uh, we have here uh, Doris Poole, who is our artistic director, um, and who has uh, picked our fine season with lots of other people, uh, shepherded that process, and uh, also with lots of other people selected our directors, most of whom are here today. Uh, and Warren just walked in. Yay! We haven't moved. Apologies. We haven't moved anything. Oh, you can. It's all up for grabs right now. Okay, so we may move some of these uh, pieces in a second. So, um, uh, one of the things, uh, the, the reason we're having this meeting is uh, many fold. One is so that we can actually present the season again uh, to uh, interested people. Uh, we had a um, a season sneak peek, and uh, before we were able to finalize our season, um, and uh, after many machinations and uh, uh, trials and tribulations, our season has finally stabilized, and we've got some different shows than we thought we were going to have, um, but we're very excited about it all. So we're going to reintroduce the shows as well this time as their directors. So the directors will come up and we'll express a little bit about uh, their vision for the show and what they're looking for and what they're needed and what they're uh, needing. And then um, this will also give people who are interested in volunteering either a technical or some other context an opportunity to ask those directors questions and maybe feel energized, inspired, or find a show they want to volunteer on, find an area they want to work on. We are always, always looking for New people who are interested in learning and doing lights, sound, costumes, uh, painting, uh, backstage help, all areas. Um, so uh, we do um, a lot of shows in a year. Uh, this year we're at six. Uh, we're not doing a holiday show this year. Um, and so to keep everybody fresh and excited and enthused, we need lots of people to help. Because if one person works on six shows, they end up in the funny farm. And <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Um, so we're really excited to have you all here. Um, we're going to provide a lot of sort of logistical information about how a season works and calendars and coordination and, and some of those things uh, uh, for producers and directors. Um, uh, but it's also good for our volunteers to hear sort of what goes on behind the scenes as far as putting on a full season and not just a single show. Uh, the other thing I would personally like to put in a pitch for is that running an organization is more than just like this, is more than just putting on shows. It's managing an organization. And we have a board of directors, and we have lots of other events and activities that exist in parallel with our season. Um, 
some of these are longer term, some of these are short term. Um, but if you are interested in helping us to actually run the organization, uh, please uh, let us know, let me know, let uh, Therese know. Uh, my email address is very simple, it's president at thecolonialpleasures.org. That will find me. Um, and uh, we have lots of opportunities to help uh, outside of the outside of just working on the show, which is, of course, why we're here. Uh, but managing the organization itself is also a bit of a time and energy uh, uh, requirement. And the more people we have, the more fun we have doing it. So, um, I don't know. I think I've covered it. Bathrooms, really logistical. Bathrooms are around the corner here and upstairs. Uh, emergency exits, <laughs> right there, and the one we came in in the room. Uh, is there anything else? Um, so again, welcome, and I'm going to turn it over to Therese, who's going to set the stage for the Good Artistic uh -oh. Director Award. <laughs> uh, thank you, Steve. Yeah. And, and, and uh, uh, Debbie said we picked it up, yeah, well, so, so right. I'm going to move that sofa out of the way just so it doesn't block it. You guys have it okay? Thank okay. you. Very light. Hi, everybody. Um, it is very gratifying to see so many people here on a Saturday morning. Sorry. It was the one time we could get all of the directors together. It was really essential that that happened. And to see so many of the folks that are already part of show staffs or looking to be part of show staffs is um, exciting. So I'm really glad that Steve talked a little bit about how much the season has changed. Uh, we start, you know, in the summer prior to come up with the season, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the slate as it is because this is the point where we move it from the conceptual on the artistic side to the real <laughs> on the production side. And we want to make sure there's not a breakdown in understanding about why these plays were chosen, what we're trying to accomplish with this season so that we can have, come on in, get yourself comfortable. <laughs> We're gonna be working on this end of the theater, so try to keep people down on this end. Um, anybody who's, who's ever heard anything about play selection or served on it knows that there's, there are a lot of different factors, and we look at balancing you know, the number of male and the number of female roles. We look at uh, trying to get people of different ethnicities than we might commonly see on a solo player stage uh, into the theater. Uh, we work on having you know, some classics and standards and some modern and some new stuff. We look for things that are challenging for the acting and di um, directing teams. We look for things that are challenging for our production teams. Having just, we one of the very few theaters that's open uh, last year in the area. And having had a very, very aggressive, I don't mean that in a, <laughs> in a bad way, but it was a very aggressive slate in that we were really booked in. We were scheduled to do 11 shows, I think, 10 or 11 shows in 13 months. Um, 10, 10 shows in 13 months. Uh, we did cancel one of those, so uh, out of necessity. But there was a lot going on last year, and so one of the commitments that the artistic team made to the production team was that we will guarantee to bring you several shows that are on a scale of one to five that are underneath a three. At least two of those shows that we bring you will be uh, less complex, less demanding of our production teams. And it's important for those of you who are going to be designing, who are going to be working on those shows, to understand that we are expecting that from some of the shows. There are, There is room to do a lot things and sometimes it takes greater creativity and greater consideration to keep things simple and to tell the story and capture that essence than it is to put a whole lot of splash and dazzle on. Although splash and dazzle can be a lot of fun. <laughs> We're all close to that. Uh, so just keep that in mind as, as we're hearing about the plays. Uh, the directors that have been chosen we are very thrilled to have working at the 
this stage again. Some have not been here for quite some time, some fairly recently, and a couple are familiars that you'll, you'll uh, be accustomed to seeing. The um, last year, uh, I think the board projected that we would probably be about 30,000 well, behind <laughs> where we wanted to be uh, for the year. And it, it appears that we may not be quite that far behind. And we are incredibly fortunate that we can say we can handle this. We are well aware how lucky we are that we are in that position. But as you can understand, we can't operate on that <laughs> on an ongoing basis. We can't be losing $30,000 a year uh, ad infinitum. So we, we've got to, we weren't trying to get a check on that in terms of bringing the shows in on budget. Some will require a few extra things, but boy, you're going to be much loved if somebody comes in and says, oh yeah, we were able to do it for $300 less than you expected. <laughs> that, that would be great. Okay, so um, we're going to get these directors up here and have them start telling you a little bit about their show. This is just to whet your appetite. They're going to have a few minutes each to give you some background, tell you what kinds of positions they have open and available, uh, what positions might already be filled, so that you know that. And you'll just get a chance to see them and associate that director with the show. We do it in chronological order of the season, and we begin this season with a show called Art. Um, the director is Debbie Barber, and she'll be up in just a second. Uh, I, because Debbie is already underway, they have already cast, God, come on in. There's plenty of room over here. You're welcome to go wherever you feel comfortable. <laughs> um, they are already in rehearsal, and so they are already staffed. But this is for everybody to get to know all about the show, so Debbie is still going to tell you all about art. Okay? Thank you. Hey, good morning. Hey, everybody. Um, so briefly, um, art is um, a fairly small, very small show. Cast of three. We've been going for about a month now. We had auditions about a month ago, and um, we are rolling. Um, so it was chosen partly uh, for its simplicity, and on the scale of one to five of complexity, um, I've been told it's about a two. So that has a lot to do with a very minimal. Uh, the set isn't finished yet, but it's um, we're well on our way here. Um, and uh, it's basically it's basically a, a show about um, three friends in Paris. This is kind of hard, so excuse me. Uh, about three friends in Paris in the '90s, male, who uh, one of whom has spent two hundred thousand francs, a huge amount of his income, to buy an almost painting. There it is. Um, and in hilarity ensues. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a serial comic, and uh, you know, it is about art to some extent, but it's really about this friendship between these three gentlemen. And um, it's, a, it's a, essentially a long one act. It's 90 minutes, no intermission, and um, it's really a lovely intellectual piece. I bet you're getting on my nerves. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You want to sit down? Sure. <laughs> and this one matches what I'm doing. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> this is why you remember what All right. Okay. It's consistent yeah, with the play, play, right? Because the all way We must possible. be flexible. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, that's so much better. Thank you, honey. Um, so, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, it's. I've also been encouraged, and I believe we're all going to be encouraged this season, to really work together as directors and designers for the um, season to kind of, for the transitions to be easier and less complicated from one show to the next. So that each show isn't kind of a standalone world unto itself and that everything has to be raised and you know rebuilt from the ground up. I'm sure that'll still happen to some extent, but um, art is a great way to start because we are very minimal. I mean, pretty much what you see is what there's gonna be except for some more painting on the floor. Um, and and uh, so, you know, the floor um, will be essentially um, beige. 
and um, everything is very minimal and very portable and very renovable. And um, we're going to have a front door there. We're going to have, um, you know, some some essentially some some building there with a shelf where other paintings are going to be displayed. That's about it, you know, and some some light stuff. Um, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, I want to tell you my staff because these are names of some wonderful volunteers and some very talented people. Um, I can't speak to their availability later in the season, but um, our producer is Scott Sanders, who is here. Our play consultant is Mary Watko, who's out, who is out of the country. Stage manager, Andy McClendon, assistant stage manager, Lori Posner. Um, our board audition rep is Kevin Brennan. We did a whole lot of other things besides that. We have our co-designers um, of costumes, Fran Marchand, Janice Coffey, um, we have co-props designers, Charlotte Robinson, Mary Beth Yablonski, um, a lighting designer who I believe is new to designing here. I think he might have worked with other designers. Matt, Matthew Rigby, um, Jim Ryder is our sound designer, and Lori Nolan is our set decorator. Um, the, the carpenters are, and they, they do pretty much every show here, Ted Yablonski, Jim Robinson, they are heroes. Um, and um, I know I shouldn't take too much time, but I've also been encouraged to cast a swing and I have a, or, or someone to cover all the roles because of our COVID nightmares. So uh, we do have a swing who's gonna cover all three roles in the play and that's all I've got. So welcome to the And next up is Estelle Miller who is Back at CP after a very, very, very long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm young. <laughs> Haven't been young for a while. Hello. Hi. Hello. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. I've been in this business 56 years. I've worked in New York City and all over the metropolitan Washington area. Now I'm going to tell you about my little play. 83 minutes, no intermission, three people. A 25 year old young man a 50 to 60 year old lady, and a 50 to 60 year old male. Uh, there are no intermissions, the setup is very minimal. My lights and sound are absolutely essential, and that's one of the bigger problems we're going to have, if we have that problem at all. Um, it's very quick, it takes place. Uh, the magazine, I'm assuming, is in New York City, very quick, very quick-witted, very, very quick um, responses to each other. And it's about whether facts are important to tell your story or not. It might be a very good place to have a talk back because it's about today. It is funny, it is light, it is brilliantly written. Um, I have been fortunate enough to already uh, receive a producer whom I know and who is marvelous, young man. Uh, I have a play consultant who is Steve, who is also, I have met, and is wonderful. I'm so glad I met him. And my set designer is Ed Bridget Miller, who gave me a brilliant set and solved my problem. I needed a closet that my 25-year-old had to hide in, and I couldn't figure out how that was going to happen. And he just walked in and said, oh, this is what you're going to do. Done. Wonderful. I believe in... Uh, and, and working in a um, community. I do not uh, make demands. I compromise as long as we're putting up the play that this playwright wanted to see, and that's hard to have to interpret. So I'm not sure I actually heard the name of the play. I'm sorry. Oh, Lights Light Light Out of a Fact? Lights Out of a Fact. Yes. Um, did I not say that? I don't think. Oh, well. <laughs> there you go. I needed that help. Um, <laughs> I've been, um, I, these people spend their time trying to decide whether this brilliant essayist is telling the truth about all aspects of the essay that he wants to put in this magazine. This magazine is faltering. It's been in existence for many, many years, and this woman has been editor for many, many years. And she has this magazine she has to keep on the street. And this man, whom apparently she knows, wrote this brilliant essay. She brings in this 25-year-old, brand new journalist, wet behind the ears, 
And she, she tells him that his job is to make sure that he does all the fact checking necessary to put this in print so that they don't get sued. And basically that's what you're supposed to do. You don't get sued. This brilliant young whippersnapper decides that everything this man wrote, the date, the time, the place, the amount of traffic, is all made up. It's not true. It's that he said it's supposed to be five people, it's really ten people if you do the he brings in mountains, mountains of mistakes or errors in information that this essay has, has given. So the argument becomes, it's my essay. I don't have to have all the facts. I can embellish so that I give you the point, the point. And this argument goes on uh, part half of the play, and it is brilliantly done. It, the lines are marvelous. They're funny. They're light. And... Um, and I enjoyed reading it the first time. And the second time I enjoyed it even more. And the third time I'm still laughing. <laughs> However, the bottom line is that we never know whether or not she puts it in her magazine. That's the clutch. Whether or not she actually publishes it because of all this fact checking. She gives a deadline you have from Wednesday to Monday to do all the fact checking and correct. The author of the essay isn't going along with what they're telling him, what this kid is telling him, and then it becomes like a father and son fighting with each other. It's really done brilliantly. In the end, we don't know if the actual play, that the actual essay is put in the magazine. The other part of this is when the audience walks out and they, and they say, oh, that was fun. I wonder what really happened. I want them to also know this. Do we all do this? Do we all? embellish to get our points across. Now I'm going to go back to say this to you. Did I tell you the truth? Have I done this for 56 years? Am I from New York? And have I had walked all over? And I have lived and worked all over Metropolitan Washington. Was I right? Did I do it? Am I telling you the truth? When you walk out of here, will you know? No. Will you believe in me? Maybe. Come on and work with me and you'll find out. <laughs> I am in need of a sound designer, a light designer, properties, a stage manager. Now, the stage manager, she's got to, he or she has got to be able to blindly walk me around this room because I have not worked here. I have worked behind the scenes here many years ago, but I have not directed here. So I need somebody that's willing to get a shelf. This is where you, this is the dress, you can't go in that room. This is the dressing room. This is. You know, I know how to pull these things out and put it back, put it back. And so I, I'm really anxious to have someone that's brought here to work to do that for me. I love theater. I enjoy what I do. I've been doing it for so, and I have been doing it for over 50 years. Some of my plays have been absolutely brilliant. Some of my plays have been, I'm walking away too. <laughs> and my eyes covered. Some of it have got rubies. Some of them have been, uh, Watch, that watch group that used to be around. Okay, yes, I, I was president of a group. My background is irrelevant. The fact, the important thing is that I love what I do. I want the people that I work with to love what they do. I want us to all get along well, end up being a family, because that's what this is all about. That's what theater is. That's what our culture is. Without this culture, we don't have. And right now, we need as much as we can get. So, you want to come aboard? I'm on a board. We're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> My apologies for not setting that up a little bit better with an English law. I'll, I'll do better on this next one. In fact, a lot of people don't even know that this change has happened. One of the many gyrations that we've had, uh, some of them were due to having difficulty with getting directors for the time frames with which shows were slotted. Some of it, uh, it just became evident that COVID is not going completely away at any point soon. Therefore, we need to um, replace some of the larger shows, which is why we have the, the holiday show that we had planned. But in this instance, we did not get the rights to the play that we had chosen and that we had a director for. And working with Robin Schwartz, uh, we came to an agreement with, along with Ernie, the production director, 
that um, a, an acceptable substitute would be a, a really nice name <coughs> in the theater to be doing that would have some audience appeal, and that is Crimes of the Heart. Robin? Hi, everybody. Wow. Really nice crew for 9 o'clock in the morning. This is wonderful. Um, regardless of what play I have the honor of doing on this stage, I'm just I'm thrilled to be back. I'm always filled with joy at the opportunity to be able to work with colonial players. So I am um, Robin Schwartz. I'm directing Crimes of the Heart. It's going to be in the January time slot of next year, so we'll start sometime around October, um, and the performances are January 6th to the 28th. Um, this play is going to be casting four women um, and two men, all extraordinary roles. Um, the play is set in Mississippi in 1974, uh, and the space is going to be the kitchen of the home where it takes place. The people who live in the house are the McGraths. Um, the main characters are the McGrath sisters. There are three of them, Lenny, Meg, and Dave. And the McGrath sisters did not grow up in a happy home. They had a very troubled childhood, and life has been throwing hit after hit after hit at them. And the play explores how they how they navigate it. How do they deal? Um, they're all dealing with some amount of mental illness because of the things that they've been going through. Um, I think that a lot of people seeing the show, and I, maybe a lot of us in this room, can identify with just feeling like, what do you do when you just can't take it anymore? And um, when life just keeps seeming to to challenge you in a way that you are not capable of dealing with. Um, these sisters are really wonderful character studies for some really wonderful actresses to come in and help the audience see how when you have people in your life who will support you unconditionally, that you can make it through anything. Because in the end, you do get this heartwarming sense that the sisters are going to be okay. Um, it is definitely a dramedy. It is a real life comedy drama. It is totally tragic in some moments and absolutely hysterical in others. Um, I want the audience to walk in feeling like somehow they're really walking into this home. Not in a realistic sense, but in a way that all of the production elements marry and come together and make the space feel warm and like you're coming home again. Um, the other characters in the show, those are the three women. There's also a cousin, Chick, who is a female, who is a character. Two men, Doc, who is Meg's ex-boyfriend, and Barnett, who plays Babe's lawyer. Babe needs a lawyer. She needs a bad. She shot her husband. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, in the end, heartwarming. It's going to be a really, really nice production for, especially in this space. It's going to translate well into this space. Um, on the production side, I'm very fortunate to have nearly a full production team already, but I'm always open to seeing if people are interested in um, interning or observing, assisting in any design element. I would go to my designers and ask if they were looking for assistance or at least somebody who would like to learn the ropes. So if there's anyone new who would like to jump aboard, please feel free to um, talk to me. I'll send you the script. So far on the production staff, we have Jennifer Cooper as producer, Joan Townsend as play consultant, um, Heather Quinn is designing our set, our lights by Eric Hufford. Costumes are being mentored by Carrie Brady. And Harry is looking for someone who can take the lead on costumes. So if anyone here is a costumer, yes, please. Um, sound will be designed by David and Noah Cooper. The props and set dressing by Connie Robinson. And stage management is still open. So I have one interested party who um, is still considering it, but I'm definitely looking for somebody who might be interested in assisting or learning the ropes on that. Um, above all, people who work on my team, it's incredibly important to me 
that they leave this process feeling empowered, feeling like they brought their best work to the project, and that they are happy that they spent their time, their January, the dreary January, here at Colonial Planners. Um, I want to support everyone creativ creatively, and I want everyone to feel like they've left a piece of themselves on the project. So just know if you're hoping to join the team, it's going to, I try to support a really positive, collaborative process and um, hope everyone has some fun doing it. So again, if you have any questions or would like to stick them to you, um, just ping me and thank you all for coming. It is through sheer happenstance that the first three directors of a six show season are female. And sheer happenstance that the second three directors are male. <laughs> but we um, finding that that kind of parity is not very easy, especially when it comes to casting. You've probably, if you listen to people, you've probably heard that the first two shows are very male heavy. That's never intentional. Uh, it was because some things had to be replaced and switched around, but we start to make up for that uh, with Crimes of the Heart. But, so now we'd like to, oh, incidentally, I have I have worked for each of those three women as directors, and they're all wonderful. I haven't worked for any of these male directors, but I have seen their work, and I know that they're all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move on then to the next show up, which is the big kahuna, if you will. And that is directed by Richard F. Nichols. It's called The Book of Bill. The Book <laughs> of Will. <laughs> Who's Will? Well, it's the original Will I Am, William Shakespeare. <laughs> and it's about the first folio of the book of his first 36 or 37 plays. Um, and how it came about. Like many things. It's set in 19, uh, 1619 to 1623. Um, and, you know, think Shakespeare in love. Uh, Rob Stark Crow, if you've seen that with Ben Elton, uh, or maybe you've seen Bingo by Edward Bond, The Beard of Abel by Anna Freed. It's all around that Shakespearean time. Except Shakespeare, although the biggest star in this, this play, never appears. He's already dead by the time you start this play. So, uh, Three of the uh, King's Men, uh, Hemmings, uh, Richard Hemmings, uh, Richard Burbage, John Hemmings, and uh, Henry Condell get together and decide that they want to produce the first part. For this, we only have the portraits, which were dubious about the actual reproduction of this. But if you're a big Shakespeare fan, this is you. <laughs> There's no real great Shakespearean lines in it, apart from maybe Ben Johnson's role, gets to do the fourth for the first folio. Um, this play so excited me when I read it. And I'm, I'm a sub vocalizer, so when I read something, I read it in real time from Max Gooch within half hours to read it. And then I spent about five to six hours online just researching all the people in this play. These are real people with real histories, and such interesting histories as well. Richard Hemmings was apprenticed to be a grocer in London at the age of nine. Can you imagine that? Age of nine. <laughs> Eleven years as an apprentice grocer before he got his guild membership at 21. Um, married uh, Rebecca Hemmings, who was a widow at 16, <laughs> because her first husband, also an actor, was stabbed in the throat from in a fight with another actor. You can't trust actors with big pointy things. <laughs> right? It's a fun show. But it, t it tells the story of the first photo from, from the idea, the concept by these, these three men, the King's men, uh, who were part of Shakespeare's playing group of the globe, uh, all the way through to the final product of the folio. We are going to produce a folio. I don't know how, but we are. My wife knows how, because she comes from a long line of forgers. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we're going to uncover that. Um, I have, uh, uh, I do have a producer, uh, Herb is my producer, right, Andy? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, finally have a producer, like last week I got the message. Uh, Lois is my play consultant, which I'm really excited about. 
Um, and then we're starting the collapse staff. I have my stage manager just confirmed today that yes, she will definitely do it. So I have Nell Copper, who stage managed my last show here in 2011. Um, so I'm really excited about that. She's got a huge background in Shakespeare as well. Um, we're looking, Alex is doing my lights. Um, I'm looking for a sound designer. I'm looking for a set designer. I have grand ideas for this set. It's going to require a set designer with an engineering or architectural background. I have to simplify it, but if we can pull off the set I have in my head, everybody's going to be amazed. I don't want to give spoilers. There are so many spoilers I could give you. Um, it's a great show. Um, the folio is the star of this show, um, but this, this show honors the number of deaths. It honors the death of William Shakespeare. There are three deaths in the show itself, and it honors death. And I think it, this is my pitch to the play selection committee, to the director selection committee, is it's honoring death, this show. And I think over the last two years, I know I've lost friends in the community, in the theatre community, through COVID or other things, we're, we're losing people all the time. Death happens, and I think this is a great play to say life goes on and legacies live. And, and we can put, every time we put a show on this play, that's a little bit of our own legacy. Um, you know, um, anybody who knows me knows I'm a big fan of Terry Pratchett. And one of his sayings is uh, a man never dies, one of his. Quotes, a man never dies while his name is still spoken. Shakespeare's name is still spoken 400 years plus after his death. The photo was printed in 1623. And this play goes up 2023 at the 400th anniversary of the Folio Community. I'm really excited about that. We're looking to get involved with uh, the Folio and uh, talk with them. It's supposed to be close to home. And I have um, Harriet Bradshaw's. Harry Bradshaw is a Greek dramaturg and is super excited about that. So, um, and it's going to be very important to your people. If you want to come on board, come speak to me. Uh, I, I love to mentor people. I love to help crews get mentored. I've been part of this theater for 20 years, and I love to help people help train people up. So, that's it. to our musical, uh, which is a little bit smaller than our last musical, because we brought in about a cast of thousands. And, uh, uh, we're trying to keep things a little bit smaller this year with a few exceptions, but we really went for name recognition by selecting a Stephen Sondheim. It is a musical review of sorts, but with a, a little bit of a story to go with it. I'm very pleased to introduce Vince Musgrave, who is directing. Hello, everybody. My name is Vince Musgrave. Um, I'm the musical theater host. <laughs> so, um, I didn't want to forget anything, and I tend to to rattle in in different. I'm like a herding cat person. You've got to like herd me in the right direction. So I tend to try to surround myself with amazing people that keep me moving in the right direction just because I know that I am that person. So I had to write it all down just to make sure that I didn't forget anything. Um, putting it together is a musical review. It's showcasing the songs of the late great Stephen Sondheim. Uh, drawing, drawing his title from, from Sunday in the Park with George, the review came about through the many requests for an update to Side by Side by Sondheim, which was produced in 1976. Um, we will try to present the 1999 incarnation of this show. Um, putting it together, though, a review, it does have a slight pot, plot taking, um, taking place at an all-night black tie party at a penthouse. The host, an older couple, face their delusions and marital troubles as a younger, less jaundiced couple struggle with their feelings and desires, and a commentator oversees and influences the action. The spouses deal with infidelity and divorce, but finally reconcile before the dawn. Um, to talk a little bit about my vision um, is to showcase Sondheim's songs with as little hindrance from set pieces and props as possible. Sondheim, as many of you know, is the master of creating songs that tell stories and expose the human condition. In 
in that, he creates a virtual playground for vocalists and actors to, to showcase their talents. His songs are full of feeling and thought and words, beautiful words, that push both the performer and the audience to new heights and experiences. In design, I see what? <laughs> seems to be a theme. A blank page, um, to use a quote, what? A blank page or canvas, his favorite. So many possibilities. The set I see as minimal, two seating, a bench, a chair, white walls with hints of angles to mimic the windows of a penthouse apartment or New York skylines. The, one of the stars of the show, I think, will be lighting, so I'm looking for an amazing lighting designer. The ability to paint with color. The set, the entire theater as the songs are being performed. A joint effort to evoke emotion and feeling, at least for your eyes, ears, and your heart. Costuming is formal, black tie, beaded gowns with tuxes, with the possibility of adding a genius touch of color here and there to add to our painting. The band. As a musical, we have to deal with an orchestra of some sort, whether that be panned, whether it be piped in, as being in this particular arena, I hear that that can become uh, problematic. So we've been trying to work through that. Um, my vision for that is a small party band, is what I would love to see, and for them to be on stage as part of the, the penthouse party. Um, a piano, an upright bass probably, a small drum kit, and maybe another instrument. Um, for that, sound design will be crucial for balancing board and vocalist. And I would also love to, to paint that party with sound, have party sounds as in between songs as the show is moving along. Um, so looking for a great sound designer as well. The cast is two women and three men. They have to be amazing vocalists and incredible storytellers. I'm thinking of adding, in our world of COVID now, adding an extra male and female to our cast to work as internal understudies as well as being part of the cast. Um, in a musical, it's often easier to have your performers work as internal understudies so that they can cross over. If this person can't sing that song, this person steps in, that person does that. And if we add two extra performers to our cast, it will actually make that a little easier to continue our storyline as well as to continue the show without any alterations or problems. My staff as it stands, um, myself, I will be directing and choreographing. Um, our music director is Andrew Gordon, who is also in his own right an incredible choreographer. Um, Trent Goldsmith as the orchestra coordinator and advisor. Both Andrew and Trent are accomplished musicians and more than likely will be working on the show as well. Um, Jim Gallagher is my musical advisor, my play advisor. Um, Judy Wilkinson is my production manager. Um, we are still looking for some amazing visionaries. I, I like to work, as I said before, with people that are willing to take the helm of what they do and to jump in you know, full-fledged. I will be the first person to say I do not know how to. So um, I still do not know how to log onto the computer to get the schedule that they put out for the set. <laughs> so <laughs> I will be the first person to tell you I cannot. You know, so my stage manager, I lean on 100% to be able to do a lot of that and to say, okay, Vince, you need to hit this button. And I go, okay, where did you send it? I send it through email. Just hit the link. Okay. What's the link? It's the one that's highlighted. Okay. Which one was that? Okay, never mind. Um, I really am that person. So um, I am, but in every aspect of a show, I really do work on a collaboration. I work um, with full give and take. I do have visions for certain things, and I will try to push until someone, a set designer or someone says, Vince, that's not going to work because physics doesn't work that way. <laughs> I won't understand what that means, but they will have to literally draw it out and show me if I do this, this will fall over. Oh, okay. So in that, I need people that are that can take the helm of things, people that are willing to dive in to help create the full picture that we are looking for. Um, as I said, Sondheim is a feast 
you know, for for every aspect of it. And the star in this particular venue are his songs. Um, we need a stage manager. As you know, someone who can hurt cats very well. Um, a lighting designer, a costume designer, a set designer, and a sound designer. So if you are willing to step into the realm of musical theater and to deal with um, you know, some amazing um, prospects of doing incredible magic, you know, please come and talk to me. I would love to talk some more about the show and about the vision and about you know, getting it up on its feet, feet and bringing Sondheim to Bologna. Uh, last but not least, by any means, uh, you will probably notice that hearing these directors talk about their enthusiasm and their passion for the show, uh, that that's what director selection was this year. We were wildly entertained <laughs> by these prospective directors, and we, we just popped the way uh, because they are so dedicated. Ravenscroft by Don Negro um, is a supernatural murder mystery thriller comedy, um, which uh, is an interesting combination of things. Uh, I, I put to the committee, which I think is interesting. I am really uh, interested in the interplay of how we experience the release of both um, suspense and horror, and how we experience the release of humor, right? And that interchange of what it's like to be scared of something, but then have it revealed to just be something funny. Yeah, uh, sort of like a, a clue, in a sense. Uh, so uh, the story of Ravenscroft is very straightforward. Um, there's been a murder at this sort of remote manor house in England in the Edwardian kind of early 1900s period. Might be late Victorian. I, we're not going to be pedantic about this. It's not historical drama, right? And so uh, an investigator goes to find out you know, about the, the murder of the lord of this household, and there are five women in this household, all of whom confess to the murder. Um, and so uh, the first act is this very kind of tense kind of interaction between the inspector and, uh, and each of these sort of women as he, as he kind of questions them and kind of tries to figure out what's going on in this household, um, uh, by the end of which sort of everything has just kind of gone to complete chaos. Um, the second act, uh, in the second act, uh, he's drunk the entire time and just gets drunker and drunker until the end of the play. Uh, which is a uh, wonderful and a, a wonderful uh, opportunity for a great uh, 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 acting uh, experience. That's what drew me to the play immediately uh, was the sense that this is really an actors and directors play. We don't we're not going to need a lot of special effects, right? It's not going to be sort of complicated in a technical way. Uh, it's going to be a very fun sort of uh, acting and directing experience. Um, so yeah. So anyway, that's kind of the, the sort of overview of the plot. I think in, in general. Um, the other thing I just want to say is. It's, it's very funny, and it's, um, a lot of that humor relies on it sort of being very British uh, in its sort of conceptualization. I have no idea if we're going to try to do this with accents. This is, this is like a year away, right? So I haven't thought about any of that yet. Um, I don't know if we're going to do it with accents. I don't know if we're going to have an accent coach. I don't know if we'll just do, you know, I don't know how we're going to approach that. Um, but I'm interested in lots of ideas. And so um, for me, um, when I'm looking for staff, when I'm looking for people to work with, I'm always looking for people to collaborate with. Um, that's my general mode of operation. Um, anybody who's worked with me understands that that's how I operate. Um, so uh, I, when we're when we're doing a show and putting together a show, come on in. Um, we need a mask, I think. Uh, oh, uh, do we have extra masks? Yeah, we'll get you. Uh, Steve will get it. Great. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, I just think of myself as like I'm steering the giant out of control ship, and hopefully just generally getting it somewhere near the dock. Um, uh, Rebecca Contrava is producing, uh, who I haven't met yet. Hello, Rebecca. Oh, good. We finally get to meet. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, I just found out that Ed Miller is uh, the play consultant, uh, so that's that's fantastic, or hopefully we'll agree to be the play consultant at some point in the next several days. Um, but again, this is a year away, you know, so I don't need to be on everybody's schedule quite yet. Um, I have a, a wonderful uh, sound designer who's going to soundscape for me, and Richard F. Nichols, who trained it, see, that's how we do sometimes. Um, and then uh, I need everything else. Um, and I'm excited for that. Um, I am a, I'm a teacher, uh, so um, I enjoy working with anybody of any skill level. 
Um, if we need a mentor to help you out, that's fine. If we need assistance to help people out, that's fine. If there's something you haven't done in theater and you want to try to do it, let's talk. Let's see, you know, let's see where we can work together. Because um, for me, that's the joy of theater, is getting to see people do their art, to get to see people experiencing the opportunity to really express themselves. So um, that's my show. That's my pitch. Thank you very much. <laughs> Executive producers of these plays. 
there is there will be an email address for your show to help you communicate. It's specifically for your show, show name, tap, equalodeonplayers.org. So that helps with communication. People can contact you that way. Uh, also, one point, very important point that I want to raise with producers right now, and I will remind you again, is that contracts um, for flight consultants, uh, dialogue coaches, music, musicians, anything like that needs to be negotiated by our treasurer. Please do not go uh, signing contracts with consultants uh, on your own. That needs to go through the treasurer, and I will remind you of that again and again. Uh, that's all I've got for right now. Let's, what else do we need to do? Oh, the matrix. Uh, we've also developed a, a what do we call it, a production matrix. Uh, it has, you know, it's a list of all your, all your uh, designers, all your staff. Uh, contact information goes in there. Uh, we also have the dates of your shows and the, the dates that things need to happen when you're, you know, what's to get, get your uh, get headshots and publicity photos done so that um, marketing can put those out in the timely fashion to advertise for your shows. Uh, when do your auditions need to happen? You know, it's a, it, it may seem like a lot of rules, but it's, it's to help you get through the process to you know, so that things don't sneak up on you. You know, that we lay that out, those timelines, those dates, so that you're not scrambling to get things done uh, because you get, you know, of the million things that you have to deal with, you know, that one fell off. So um, we will send you the producers and directors, you'll have access to that. Um, please. Keep that updated as your, as your staffs, um, as you fill those out, as you uh, complete your staffs. You know, we want to know who's working on your show so we can keep, keep in contact with those people. Anything else? Um, what, what else did I forget? No, I think that's it. Okay. Okay. So, for our production, yeah. There it is. Yeah. As the producer, and the producer is very, very active, very busy, very hands on, and present a, bit, a great deal of the time. Um, I'm going to contrast that a little bit because artistic doesn't drop the ball. It, we don't like to shoot the thing over the fence and say, See you next year. Um, we're not wrong. The play consultant is a representative from the artistic function, and the play consultant serves as the, um, they, they are the conduit to the board to prove uh, the artistic director. So all play consultants will be reporting to me on a regular basis. They tend not to be as constantly present at rehearsals and at um, meetings and so on, because this is the person who brings a fresh eye. When they come in to look at things once a week, once every two weeks, that's that's the most that they can really screw up. Um, but they can, you know, go and they, Report back, everything is right on track, things are going okay. Oh, uh, we have a little trouble over here. I think of the director, the producer, and the play consultant as a three legged stool. Without any one of those three, we don't have a very stable base to set the rest of the play on top. And the play consultant will serve as um, the bridge between conceptual, here's what we bought. <laughs> When we pay for the rights for this show, and here's what winds up on the stage. They're there to help the director keep focused on the truth of the story, on what the um, what the playwright uh, intended, and that they stay they maintain the vision that they they sold to the director uh, so 
selection committee. This is not to say that the play doesn't grow. <laughs> we know that that happens. We love when that happens. That's what's supposed to happen. Uh, what we try to make sure doesn't happen is that an idea or something like Debbie suggested that her show is at about a level two. And uh, Alex also commented that Ravenscroft is very, very low tech on the land. I get that. When people get together and they start talking about, well, we could do this, oh my God, that, and we're, pretty soon you have these glorious designs for all kinds of pyrotechnics. <laughs> and Colonial doesn't always have the support staff to make that stuff happen. What a designer can conceive of, we may be able to do, but we can't do all of that for everybody for all of the shows. And so the play consultant will help us, you know, just let's keep centered. Let's remember what we're doing here <laughs> and where we're headed. Play consultants can jump in and offer all kinds of unexpected assistance. Uh, there are not, I remember one time as a play consultant, there was one individual who was not learning their lines. Wonderful auditioners, we knew from the community, we didn't know them, just wasn't learning the lines. And it was obvious he was very frustrated. He did not. Couldn't say what the problem was either. We chatted, found out that he was a single guy, he was new to town. He didn't have anybody to run lines with. He didn't have a spouse or a best friend or a neighbor or another actor that he knew. I was like, well, that's an easy fix. I can get you a line coach. <laughs> we, I can find people to run lines with you anytime. Uh, so there are those instances. And other times it's much more serious. We've had an instance where an actor was not working out. And after the play consultant worked with the director, the director and the play consultant talked with the actor, then they brought it to, I was artistic director at that time, they brought it to me and that's when the artistic director, as Ernie said, then the producer gets involved, or he, in that instance, the artistic director gets involved, and if you're not able to deal with that, then you pull in the executive producer, the other executive producers. And I did, I informed the president, who was Joan at the time, that we were going to be replacing an actor, and that, you know, we to minimize the effect on everybody. It turned out to be a happy story because that individual was having a marriage crisis. They are happily remarried, <laughs> have been for over 20 years now. And um, they also uh, were able to supply the name of somebody that they thought would be a good replacement for them. So there was not animosity on the part of anyone in it. But I mean, things crop up, life happens. And so uh, we try to provide you with the producers and the play consultants to help you as directors um, to get where you're going in your show. Um, I have here, and some of you over, I, I know all the producers, play consultants, and directors have received this calendar. Uh, I don't have a for everybody, but if any of you want to take one of these, it's two-sided, and we can just kind of share with some folks there in your neck of the theater, spread that around. Uh, it is not necessary that you be able to read all the good, 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 good. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Did you get one? It's two sided. Okay. So I'm just going to ask you to take a look. Sometimes it helps to see. Uh, I think Debbie talked about transitioning between the shows. And sometimes having this visual that tells the best story in terms of what challenges. And I just want us to think about for a moment. As you see these challenges, uh, as you see the, the slate lined up here, uh, what do you notice? Let's start with the really basic stuff. What does every show open on a Broadway? Yes, indeed. And every show closes on a Saturday with one exception. No, it's a book of will, and that is because you will notice there Sunday is St. Patrick's Day, and we're not doing that. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day surprisingly is one of the biggest difficulties to work around because there's the real St. Patrick's Day and there's the parade downtown. We cannot avoid both of them. So I, if I've got this right, we avoid the parade. Yes. Yes. Because yeah. it is mass chaos, and we we suck it up and we perform on St. Patrick's Day itself. So that's 
that's the one time that we've dragged that to um, a Sunday. And in order to make it, so here's a challenge. The next show, putting it together, you can see, they will not have that first Sunday, which is that first chance where people are mostly not working and you can get the production staff in and you can finish cleaning up and start moving the next show in. You, you'll have that Sunday night because it's a matinee, but really they're going to be striking their stuff. So that's something to be aware of. And, and you and um, Richard's team are going to need to coordinate a lot on that to make that happen. So on the other hand, um, we'll, I will point out that you have a very generous full week, at, rather than just the, they call it two weeks, but it's never two weeks. It's more like 12 days or something. <laughs> and so you have not quite three weeks, but you have some time there. You were going to say something, Judy? Yeah, when is Easter? Is yeah, Easter is in putting it together, and they also close on a Sunday. Okay, so they move over to the 30th also. Yes, you're right. Um, putting it together, it's on the, what day is that? The 9th. So we move that over. Other shows, we do have park, our licenses go through Sunday in case there's, a, for some reason, we have to uh, eliminate a performance or, or um, not complete a performance, then we can make that up if possible on that Sunday. Um, we're not going to get too far into that right now. Because <laughs> I'm going to break out in hives. <laughs> um, all right, so what else do you notice about some of the shows and the scheduling and the time frames? Anything at all? Putting it together a little bit longer. Go live, go run. Yeah, it is. We try to, um, we usually have five weekends, 18 performances for the musical because um, because they have a cancellation on that one Sunday for Easter we automatically use that so you don't get 18 days you get seven but we did not want to shortchange uh, Ravenscroft anymore <laughs> by going like a whole week more I mean that's just not happening so what does this tell you about Ravenscroft when you look at that yeah they've got one of the shortest techniques available on here and so uh, he, he was really spot on when he said he's doing it as, you know, it's a director and an actor focused thing. Um, so those kinds of things will be important for you as designers to know and as stage crew to work on. Yeah, Beth. Well, just an, an anomaly for Annapolis, I do notice this year that at least they will have open prior. Ravenscroft will have open prior to commissioning me, but it is the second week of the show, which is another very difficult week to negotiate around the afterwards. It absolutely is. And, um, you know, it used to be that we expect our season finished before commissioning week, which was the first week in June. It was called June week. And so we were done at the end of May. Uh, the shows have gotten, uh, our technique has become a lot longer to do each show. Uh, this year we were slated to go through the very end of June. Take a look at when we finish up this for this season. By the 10th of June. Does anybody here know when Colonial Players' birthday is? Anybody? <laughs> Steve? <laughs> June, June 17th. June 17th. And so that will be our yes, anniversary of our very first show. Oh. Woo. And I was loath to have us in production at that time so that we could be doing something else <laughs> if we can see our way clear to be able to do that. COVID has stopped a lot of stuff. You know, it's just made a lot of things really difficult. But it would be wonderful if we were not in the, the pros of production when we're celebrating our anniversary. And that is the start of our 75th season, technically. So we, in, in that, with that in mind, we pushed everything for, we kind of crowded the front half, the, the second half of the season. And that means that we snugged Crimes of the Heart right up to January 6th. That's 
not real desirable. But it's what allows us to get all of this in in that span of time. I think it's important for everybody to understand why this is happening. You know, a lot of thought did go into it. We had to make a lot of compromises. We cannot take off every holiday to Beth's point. You know, yes, there's commissioning work. If we didn't do a show every time there's homecoming at the Naval Academy, something at St. John's, something going on in the city, a parade of whatever, we would we'd be doing three shows during the year. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is this is our best effort to give us what we need, which is some kind of a um, recognition of our 75th. Um, it's not our 75th birthday. We won't have been around for 75 years, but the 75th anniversary of our very first play. So that's kind of the story there. So that's what we're working around. And that's one of the reasons we're asking everybody as uh, various play production staffs to be looking out for each other, helping each other. How can I help you move in? Where, where are you going to need some support? So Rob is going to be looking for people who are available <laughs> over, oh, and also holidays, Christmas, and New Year's are both on weekends. And so that's cool. They'll be able to take the actual holidays off, but you can bet they're going to be in there prepping and, uh, you know, getting ready. So on the other hand, she's got the theater for all of December and a little bit of November, too, a good bit of November. So we try to ease the burden where we can, but every show has its something. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, I, I would finish this. It's a different question entirely. Go ahead. Uh, so it was about the, the screening, and I wondered where we were with screening this year. And maybe this is more a Richard question: Are you still looking for people to learn screening skills? Or well, I can tell you. I'll, I'll give you a quick background on one one thing, and then he's definitely the tech guy. I'm, I'm going to play Vince here. I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. I think I can laugh now. Story <laughs> about screening. Um, some of you know that we barely, barely, barely got the rights to the shows, and Crimes of the Heart was a last minute substitute. And on the same day, I got the rights to Crimes of the Heart and to the Book of Will, and I had to do it online because we'd been in their registration log for like four weeks and they hadn't responded to it because I asked for screening for both of their shows. And they didn't respond and didn't respond and didn't respond, and I finally got them online performance rights only. I was like, screening the jam. I want the performance rights to the show. So I got that. I paid for it. The scripts have arrived, which means, oh, directors, I have your scripts. Don't leave without them. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that means we're locked up, because I have a license and we got the scripts. They don't give you the scripts if you haven't paid for them, OK? Day before yesterday, I got a phone call from Dramatist Play Service saying, well, I see that um, we're not able to give you the screening rights for Crimes of the Heart, which I already knew. Would you still like to have the performance rights to that show? Oh, oh, yeah. That was two days ago. Oh, oh. Oh. It was so, <laughs> <laughs> And I, I wrote back to them and I said, hey, Jay, thank you. But we have, I've got the scripts, I've got the rights, I've got a license. We've advertised. We're here in the play bill. So, you know, we're going. Now, as for the screening, we've got the rights for three shows. We've got the rights for uh, the lifespan of a fact. It's every other show. Uh, we have the rights for the Book of Will, and I, we have the rights for David's Grub. So it's three out of the six. So that's where we are. Does that answer your question, Beth? Look that hard. About the extra. Yeah. So two minutes, uh, quickly. Yeah. Um, some of you are very new faces today. Great. Uh, last, well, pre-last season, as we were coming back from COVID, um, uh, the theater was able to get a grant uh, to help uh, stream, uh, buy equipment to help stream some of the shows. The Playtime version uh, was our first ever stream show for live in production. Um, in that show, which directed uh, the Love 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 War, yeah. uh, was not in the screen rights, and then I Love You Because, which was a weekend, we did have screen rights, uh, which um, was great. Um, the streams 
team. Myself, Wes Bedsworth, uh, who's also our technical director and operations director, and um, uh, Dave uh, Greg Cooper uh, from the stream team. Uh, we've been working together since May time to refine that process. We've refined it a number of times, we'll put it down. If you look around, there are four cameras in the center as we speak, and we're actually using one to record today's presentation. If you want to know more about streaming, talk to me. I'm here today, I'm here all day. Um, well, we shoot um, the, the shows from four angles. Those cameras may move. Directors who have streaming shows, and I'm looking at the two, and I can't look at myself because I don't have a mirror. Um, do not worry about streaming. Do not think about it. Do not think about where the cameras are. Um, we will position those cameras, and we will do the camera cuts as the stream scene, um, and it will all be programmed. Uh, don't have to worry about it at all. Um, it's done uh, in such a way that um, you're all hands off. And you, you give a really nice uh, presentation to the, to the people that are on the screen. Absolutely. Um, it's a great way to reach audiences that may not be able to come or are still not comfortable coming to a theatre. Uh, with COVID still veering every, every over direction it wants to, uh, or even less able-bodied uh, patients who, who or, or patients who are no longer able to get there. It's a great way to get those shows out. It's a great way to showcase the theater. I would be glad to get the stream because I'm part of the stream thing. If you want to know about more about our philosophy, there's a podcast online where I play with the podcast. I think I wrote it because I'm the producer of the podcast. Our host, Jim Ryder, is right there. We interviewed the stream team three months ago over the summer. Uh, no, over the, anyhow, anyhow. It was a great, it's a 45, 50 minute long podcast. We can tell you all about the stream. Really good, really fun to find out about that. Thank you, Richard, for that. Thank you. I um, and Richard. Could I have one more? I had another book of real questions. I don't think I've got how many people are in your cast yet. Uh, what I other think, help you need? I think it's a, it's a cast. Yeah, how many? Uh, 24 speaking roles, I believe. Uh, it's wow. the largest cast of the season. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and other help that you need. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and sorry. other help that you need. Uh, lots. Lots. We're just we're starting to build a thing. So. Okay. By the way, you're all going to have a chance to talk to the directors in just a little bit. We have a couple more things we want to make sure everybody hears, and then we're going to have a free for all. And streaming is a great segue into another point that, that like Vince, I should have written these things down and I didn't. Um, to go into technical stuff a little bit, everything. Every cue in the theater happens, goes through a single software program. Whether it's the lights, or the sound, or video projections, or stream, or a mechanical winch that lowers a trapeze for, a, for an act, uh, whatever cues go through a single software program. Producers should think about scheduling use of that program. Because if you have lights and sound and projection and screen, screen all trying to use one program on one computer in a three week period, it can get a little dicey sometimes. So if we have a, if you work with your teams to set out a schedule that makes sure they each have equitable access to that program, it, it really helps smooth out your tech end process. Also, as you're looking at recruiting your staffs and you know, you think about your designers and who's going to do my set, and who's going to do my lights, and who's going to do all these things before we open. Also think about what you need for a running crew. You know, how many people do you need to change your set? You know, do you, is it going to be a complete set change where you have to take one couch off and bring another couch on and turn it over and cover it in a different way? that you need four or five people to do, you know, 
then you need to recruit four or five people to do that. And that needs to be early. And you also need, you know, a tech to run your lights and your sound and your video and your mechanical projections and, and make sure the screen gets, gets going. We like to have two. Two is a good number. Um, that way they can alternate. They can have, you know, they don't have to be here every night. Uh, once you get, you know, we can do three. We like to have everybody run the full technical show as a tech, as a booth operator by themselves, you know, one tech, you know, so that they are in control for one show and we make sure to do that. But if we only have three shows before an audience shows up um, and we're getting, you know, three or four or five operators, that makes it a little difficult. So. I apologize for interrupting. Steve yep. is going to have to take his leave, so I want to capture him and Ernie for a moment. We'll come back to this, but we'll talk more technical and uh, production specific stuff later. They're going to talk a little bit about the, the reason we're all wearing masks in this room, which is some of our COVID protocols. So, uh, obviously, every time we think things are getting better, something else happens. Uh, so we've persisted some of our COVID protocols longer than the general public. Uh, right now, we have a requirement that when you're in our facilities, you have to wear a mask. We don't do vaccine checks um, in performance. Uh, so our audiences uh, have to wear masks when they're in, in, in the theater. We are going to look at that again. For the fall, um, we may adopt a, a, a system where, depending on the CDC evaluation of our county, it could be masks or masks optional. If we're high, then it's masks. If it's medium or low, we have the board and the COVID protocol team is still looking at options for the fall in terms of our audiences. With respect to shows and directors, Directors, as part of the casting process, can determine whether or not they want to work with vaccinated staff and cast only. That is up to the directors, because the directors have to feel comfortable working with the people that they cast and working with the people that they have on, on set. So we don't want to force a director to work with in an environment that they are uncomfortable in. We don't want to force one actor to have to work with, you know. So that is up to the director. Um, and so far, our directors have asked that all staff and crew and cast be vaccinated. And uh, we support them in that. We will support a director who wants to try something else. Um, but uh, we will provide whatever staff is necessary during the audition process and, and so forth and so on. Um, uh, I don't see that changing all that much for the season, the director's options, um, but we will uh, take a look at uh, what our audience protocols will be like, and uh, we will also take a look at what our special event protocols will be like. I, I would call this a special event because it's not directly related to an individual show. Time being, we have mask requirements. Um, stay tuned. We will publish uh, any revisions to that uh, on our website. Um, and uh, directors, uh, please coordinate with producers. And if there are any questions about what the theater is uh, thinking about as an organization, uh, directors and producers should feel free to contact the board. They can contact me or contact Ernie. Talk, other people will talk a little bit later on on some of the other mitigations we're doing, stand-ins, uh, uh, understudy-type functions. Um, several theaters in the area have had to cancel.
sold lots and lots of shows when uh, cast members uh, go down to the county. And we are doing everything we can to protect our actors and cast and crew um, and our audience um, while at the same time maintaining as many productions as we can. Uh, Freebie Friday, we lost an entire weekend. Um, and then um, the following weekend, we put in two stand-ins. Um, and then uh, we were able to do the final weekend with full cast. And, and so we actually got uh, three out of the four weekends in, and that was important. Um, other, other theaters have not been quite so lucky. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, stay tuned. Those people. 
and more important than the thousands of dollars we lose is the hundreds and hundreds of man hours that are spent contacting every one of those ticket holders, rescheduling them for performances, rescheduling the actors. It is monumentally difficult, and it's a royal pain in the backside. And we want to avoid that at all costs. We are trying to reduce the drag on all the people who are not just behind the scenes of the plays, but behind the scenes of the whole theater. Too much time has been expended on trying to make up for COVID. We are very happy we were able to continue to do shows, but we need to have fallback positions. And we're going to make very clear this year, and everybody's hearing it at the same time, directors are expected to have stand, I'm calling them standbys because a stand in is something different. I, I call them standby. It is not the same thing as an understudy. Understudies are guaranteed a certain number of performances, etc. A standby is somebody who is familiar with the play, is familiar with how you're doing it, and is willing to come in on short notice with book in hand so that we do not have to close the theater for a weekend. And it is mandatory. There were two different ways that this occurred in recent um, history, and this has worked really, really well. Both of them worked. We're not telling you how you have to get those standby. Uh, when we when we did this for uh, the first show up was uh, the Lost Boy, and they were only three weeks from opening when the mandate occurred in January, and we said, "Got to have that." The director was like, "Oh my gosh, how do we do this?" There was a lot going on. And the play consultant, there's another way play consultants help. A play consultant whose job said, I'll take care of that. And by God, she did. And they had standbys for every single role. And some of them were designers who had been there for the last two weeks of tech and knew it and were like, well, yeah, I, I, I can do that role. I'll put the script in my hand, I'll do it. Some of them were spouses who said, well, if I have to, I can come in and cover something for somebody. And the director had a role. And, uh, you know, they had it covered, and by the end of that week, I had a list, and the stage manager had a list of who to call if somebody was sick. And I think that they actually had to use standbys as stand-ins for tech week. <laughs> yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was one of them. Yeah. I was the one stood in. He was stood in. <laughs> yeah, he, he was sick. So, by our lighting design. So it worked, and it, it's okay to do that. The a very different scenario for art, uh, they had a nice turnout and they had some really capable people. People, There's three men in the show and she said, you know, there's this one person here that's got flexibility enough that could do any of the three roles because they're not widely different in age. Um, and he's agreed to be the swing for all three, swing, standby, whatever you're calling them. Um, and so he will be at rehearsals. He will see what's going on. He will have a chance to read in. And both of those extremes are fine, and any other way is fine. But I will say, at least three weeks before you open, you need to know who your standbys are going to be. Now, they have one for that show. There's only three people in the cast. We're not sending an entire cast on the script in advance. You know, we know that the, that's not going to happen to the audience or to us or to all the work that's gone into it. But when you've got a show with 17 people in it, if we got four people up there with scripts in their hands, that's what it's going to be. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention too that our costumer has also jumped in and she's planned his costume. If he needs to go on and yes. our, our characters are color coordinated, he's got three costumes. That's terrific. So he's ready to roll. Yeah. He to go for this. And I realize this will be difficult for some people and uh, it's more difficult for some shows than others. Your play consultants will help you, they'll work with you, I will work with you. Um, but we must protect our productions from the possibility of closure. We just can't operate that way. All right, that's my bad talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It is. I'll tell that's, you what. That's prepared talk. That's 
Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, doing things variety. like ushering, doing things like working at the audition desk, doing things like being a standby, really puts you close to the theater. You get to meet a lot of people, and you get to know the people and how things are, and they get to know you. So they'll look at you. <laughs> as, oh, that's a possibility for a committee, for a crew, for a team, a cast, or whatever. So, you know, seize the opportunities that you get. Is it? Yes, what is the best way to get copies of scripts? Is it through the library, Amazon? Um, it, it's best to talk to the directors. The, the scripts are now in the director's hands, so it's best to ask them. And we're going to get you there in one, one more thing that everybody needs to hear. And you all saw Amy creep in. She's very <laughs> quiet, but can't be told. Um, so Amy is our marketing director, and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the things we've alluded to on the, um, the Matrix. And that is about, it's not just production, it's not just artistic. We've got people working in the box office, we've got people working um, to sell those tickets. So come on up, Amy, and tell us what they need to know. Thank you. Yay, Amy. is a necessary evil, as we all know, they say. Um, and the most things you've ever heard, we have deadlines in there. They are just the guidelines. We will be putting those back properly as much as possible. As soon as you are cast, we will organize the photo like as quickly as possible as soon as we get that done, we can then publicize it. Miracles. Um, every show has a basic package. I call this the bronze package. If you want extras, you get in, well, you get out of it and put it. Or just throw something over the floor like I do. <laughs> and so for example, last season we had the Revolutionist, which Dirty Pig directed it. And she wanted to do a music video. The play itself is not a musical, but we made a music video. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. We got a lot of attention from it. And it was something different, and that's why we're getting the attention for it. We also do video interviews, things like that, just so that people realize there are humans on stage and behind the scenes. We're not just puppets. So, <laughs> um, that was the first thing. <laughs> expectations, yeah. Expectations again, you'll get out of it what you put in. So if you come to me with an idea, we can work on it. I'll tell you if it's feasible, and we'll work our way around it. If it's not, but we'll find a way to do it. So it's really simple. Um, I have copies for all the directors and producers of their package for the scene. The only thing is, you have to be a little organized. I'm minion number two for this year in December, so I'm really glad to not have any attention. The windows, you want it outside. It came in. You probably saw my drawings. It's colorful. Um, the designs came for that for every show. I, I just make it up as I go along, but it seems to work. Uh, we are a storefront. It makes sense to get the attention. Your marquee will change on the... <laughs> so when art finishes, the last performance, after intermission of the last performance, the marquee will change to the next show because that's the audience as they leave. They can see, oh look, there's a new show. That's the whole point of the marquee as far as I'm concerned. It's a selling tool. So <laughs> if you're Cast or crew want pictures with it, take them on the way in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I will come around to see all directors and producers and give you all the package for this, just so you can get an idea. This is just a rough guideline, nothing here is set in stone to get you painting. I know some directors have a very definite idea of what they want to do on screen, things like that. So, and some have no idea and don't care, they just want to make it happen. So, but we will get it together. Uh, any questions? No play is an island. You know, what, no one function is an island at this theater. So if you've got ideas, share them with her. She can take those ideas and run with them and make, make great things happen. But um, you have to, to help uh, grease the skids a little bit there. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is, what is it? I think we've all been waiting for it. It's uh, called the Ding Ding Ding. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have the directors and uh, play consultants and producers of the shows go to a different area of the theater so that everybody else can approach them, talk to them, ask them questions, find out about what they're looking for, tell them about yourselves, what your skills are, your capabilities, what you're interested in, exchange phone numbers, um, exchange email addresses, whatever you want to do so that they can uh, contact you later. And what I'd like to ask is that, um, I'll, I'll check with you in like, I'll spend like 30 minutes on this. 
give people a chance to move around and around. If it's going to take a little longer than 30 minutes, that's okay. But I'll be checking in with you to see how that's going. So, our <laughs>
At some point, let me know what you thought of today's event. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Was it, yeah, okay, but you shouldn't change a bunch of stuff? Let us know. This is something that CD tries to do every year, but we haven't been able to do it for the last several years, partly because we weren't producing for one full year, one and a half full years, and because um, it, we just couldn't do large group gatherings like this. So this is our first time yet for a while. Yeah, Judy. One quick question. I'm sorry, I had to leave. Okay. Did you go over the budget process and how much you chose? No, it is in the production manual. <laughs> it amounts for um, both producing the show and, in, in your case, the musicians, etc. We are we are open, and Bruce knows this. That Steve, Ernie, and I are all open to having discussions about how to to contract for what needs to be done. It's it's different from the musical. Okay, are That's we still it. doing that um, production and artistic director meeting with the director and producer little meeting that we used to have? Yeah. Well, one or the other of us will try to be at each production first in production. Um, I've tried. I've tried to cover. 
for some things. Play consultants have assisted as substitute producers to get staff until they got somebody on staff. I got into the habit as um, artistic director of arranging all of the scheduling and all of the auditions and all of the everything. And it wasn't until the very last show, Freaky Friday, that the producer said, oh, well, I'm supposed to do that. And I went, well, we haven't had any of you this year, <laughs> so I'm, I'm in a flow here. So um, there there have been a lot of things. We've, we've had to fly by the seat of our pants to a large degree this year, and it's astounding what, what we collectively, I do mean we all, all we, all of us, have been able to um, accomplish. And uh, we, we hope to do it with a lot less pain next year. <laughs> So thank you all, everyone, for your contributions today. Stand by if you want to stay, you know, stay here. If you want to take the the Richard Avenue tour of CD.